Well, good afternoon, everyone here on site, to the brave ones that made it despite the terrible weather that we have in Basel. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all our audience, online audience. So thanks for joining us today. Many of you don't recognize my face. For all of you following this open mic next in health series for three years already, you are used to seeing Rahel here in front talking to you. Unfortunately, she's sick today, so I'm going to do my very best to guide you all today in this evening on a fantastic talk on Gen AI in healthcare. I also have more bad news for you, more bad news for the audience. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, John Berger from GE Healthcare, is stuck in Frankfurt in the tarmac since four hours, and he is not making it to be on a stage. We still really hope that his flight takes off and he can join us for the last minute of Q&A or at least for the networking session. John, whenever you watch us, we're really welcoming you here as soon as you arrive. We are at the end of the year, and we've had, that's our fourth open mic of the year. So in this scenario, in 2023, we have already talked about health tech investment, about data, and about patient engagement. And today was the time to speak about generative AI. You know, this event series is usually curated by the Switzerland Innovation Park with day one. And we are very happy to welcome today, as a co-partner of this event, Zulke, who will help us moderating and will be on a stage guiding us on the latest trends on Gen AI. I want to also guide you and let you know you can make your questions both online and on site. You will very soon see a QR code on a screen. Yeah, that's your code for Mentimeter. So please, everyone online, you can submit your questions during the talk. For everyone here in person, you can either submit them online or raise your hands at the end. We will be happy to answer them too. And without more ado, I want to welcome Blaise Jaholkowski from, so, Senior Business Solution Manager at Zulke, who will be moderating our talk today. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Blaise, the stage is yours. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today with you. And well done for making it to Basel, for those who could came physically. I think we had some cancellations, unfortunately, because of the bad weather. So you have a brave ones. Um, so, yeah, very happy to be with you today in order to talk about the most exciting topic, actually, of the moment, generative AI, and how it's being used and deployed in healthcare today. So, this new technology, you now all have heard about it, uh, which be, it only became known to non-experts about a year ago now, so it's still fre quite fresh and new. Uh, this technology triggers quite a mix of feelings. So, if you ask different people from different backgrounds, uh, they, they have some fear, some hopes, uh, some are very curious, uh, some are very skeptical. So uh, actually, it's not so straightforward um, how uh, Gen AI today is perceived by the larger audience, but today we're going to definitely focus in healthcare. And in, even in healthcare, you can see that not everyone agrees on the value of, of Gen AI. Um, but for sure, nobody uh, denies that it's not a kind of breakthrough. Uh, if we look at the performance today of AI uh, in general, for, for, for example, language understanding or uh, image recognition, it outperforms humans on some metrics. And this is not an opinion, actually, it's, it's, it's a fact based on many studies. So why don't we see today a wider adoption of AI, of Gen AI especially, in healthcare? And if it's being used, how, uh, how is it being used and what are the actual use cases? What's coming next? Uh, and what will be the impact on the way patients receive their diagnosis and treatment? How will the healthcare pr pr practitioners and professionals benefit from it? In which ways are they going to be augmented, to use this new terminology? And what does it mean to be augmented? So we are going to discuss for the next hour if it's just a hype or if it's here to stay in the long term in healthcare. So I'm very pleased to have today on stage with me uh, two very brilliant people. Unfortunately, the third one, as said, Jan Beger couldn't make it. Um, in order to, uh, for them to share their educated view on the, on the topic, 
So what I especially like in this configuration here is that we have someone working for a technology consulting and engineering firm. Uh, one of the best one around, by the way, in AI, just being neutral here. <laughs> Which, um, uh, by, and, um, sorry, I forgot now what I wanted to say. Uh, and um, someone from uh, one of the most admired and largest tech company, so Google, uh, which, by the way, came up with a transformer model now, which is at the basis of uh, ChatGPT. The T from GPT stands for transformer. Uh, and unfortunately, so we don't have a, a representative of a medical device industry here with us today. But if anyone actually from the audience would like to join the panel, uh, why not? Uh, we could consider having someone from, from you. So raise your hand if you're interested to join the panel. No? Okay. Um, but anyway, we have also actually uh, ChatGPT, uh, who's going to partially replace uh, our guest who couldn't come today and we're going to ask him a few questions or him, uh, I, would say, I should say it, a few questions as well uh, so as to have opinion of, of uh, Gen AI on Gen AI, so it's going to be interesting. Um, and, um, and now we can, uh, uh, I guess, proceed with the introduction of, uh, of the speakers. So I'm very pleased to uh, ask on stage now my colleague Lisa Falco. Uh, so Lisa, please come on stage and introduce yourself. You have also a couple of minutes to give your perspective about generative AI in healthcare. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bless. Um, yes, so my name is Lisa Falco. I work as a lead consultant for data and AI at Silke Engineering. So what we do as data consultants, uh, it's that we guide companies on their journey of becoming data-driven, everything from setting up the initial data strategy to actually implementing um, whatever AI use case or just analytics use case that you would be uh, interested in. And of course, our job changed quite a lot um, when ChatGPT came out and everyone suddenly got interested in implementing this on their own, in their own companies. Uh, of course, not everyone has the same means as, uh, as uh, the big players like, uh, like Google or OpenAI. So it has to be done at a completely different uh, scale. So that is how, how we're helping company at, companies at the moment of doing it in that more low key. Um, myself, I've been working really in the interface between medicine and data for almost uh, two decades now. Um, so I've been working with developing machine learning solutions for, for the medtech industry and healthcare. Um, but most of this is now also completely relevant <laughs> with, uh, with the new uh, chat GPT. Uh, although there are new uh, there are some perspectives that I still bring, um, bring with me there. That's especially since um, um, I was, uh, before I was director of data science at AVA Women, so really focused on women's health and reproductive health. And ever since I've been staying in the, the femtech area or been advocate for, for women's health. And I think that AI has a really great opportunity of, of um, of bringing equality into healthcare in a way that it hasn't been done before because women have really been um, neglected in the healthcare system for a very long time. And it's hard to change culture, it's hard to change mindset, but technology can really help us become much faster in creating those, um, those equalities, especially uh, if it's done right. There is also a data gap, which of course creates issues and it's not a given that you solve it easily, but it's still uh, a great opportunity. Thank you very much, Lisa. And as you can hear also, Lisa is not only an expert in AI, but also in femtech. So uh, later, by the way, we have uh, audience, uh, questions from the audience. So you'll be able to ask a question to some questions to the panelists. Same for people who are remote also, we'll ask some questions. Uh, but for now, I would like to ask uh, Jas to come on stage as well, please. Do I need to jump up as well? I hope I don't get <laughs> the stage. But There's stairs. <laughs> so I'll let you introduce yourself too, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everybody. Um, excuse me, I have this thing stuck in my backside here. Ah, there we go, it's better. Um, so my name is Jazz Daliwal. I am a global principal architect for Google. Uh, I work also in, the, in a capacity as a field CTO, so I also advise uh, around these topics. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today to discuss generative AI. I think the potential to revolutionize the industry is massive. Uh, we're in the early days, so of course some things might not be perfect, obviously. I think it's incredible to see what's actually happening out there with our, our customers, but also Microsoft and others as well. They were not the only two in this field. The ability to, 
to generate multimodal AI, if you wish, the ability to create medical images that doctors can use to finally diagnose and provide treatment. I think also the ability for patients to understand what these images actually mean, because I don't know about you, but when I see a doctor, I have no idea what the doctor is telling me. I just go out there and I pray to God that it's okay. Um, but finally, the ability to be able to understand that in everyday natural language is an incredible, an incredible ability that we get. I think going even beyond that, the ability to speak with patients, so voice, the ability to listen, so also understand what is being said, understand what a doctor is saying, and actually encode that in formal medical terminology is incredibly important. And I think the biggest change is also the, the design, if you wish, of task-focused AI. So not just general chat everything or talk everything or whatever it is that we want to talk about. I'm just going to not refer to any names today, I right? uh, <laughs> promised. Um, but I think the idea about medical-focused um, LLMs, generative AI, is super important. So we can't have, we can't give love poems to our patients. We need to give them real facts and figures. We need to give them a real diagnosis. It needs to be grounded. Um, I think the, the ability for, for doing that is important. I think of AI also, generative AI, as <clears throat> not necessarily artificial intelligence, but more like <coughs> augmented <coughs> intelligence. It's actually helping you. I don't think of it as a co-pilot. It's not flying or driving anything for me. The human needs still to be in the loop. There are things in healthcare that technology cannot do. So in healthcare, the professionals, the ability to trust an individual, the ability, for example, to provide empathy, compassion, for example, um, providing comfort to somebody. No AI can do this. Which technology do you know that can do that? So there's a lot still, I think, to happen there. But I think it's a great partnership between healthcare professionals and where the path to generative AI for healthcare in particular, but also life sciences, is evolving. And the life sciences part, we can't ignore, right? So, you know, the ability to create new treatments, novel treatments, understand the language of life in, in genomics, for example, is super important. And then I think combined also with the fact that we don't always have to be ill or unwell to think about health. We can also get ahead of the curve. So be fit, be eat well, for example. Genitive AI provides fantastic information there for nutrition plans, exercise plans, information about health that I had no idea about, but now is apparently very, very uh, important to me, if you wish. So even before that stage. So I think it's going to be a fantastic time in the years coming forward, and we are measuring in years, um, the effect that generative AI will successively have upon revolutionizing healthcare. But humans are still very important, right? We haven't yet been able to uh, teach AIs the human element of healthcare. Thank you. That was a nice introduction, Jas. Actually, you partially answered to my first question, but... Uh, Great, I'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> Still going to ask it, because the word transformational, transformational is often used to describe Gen AI. So it's a question for both of you, actually. Uh, what do you think, how do you think AI or Gen AI is actually transformational for, for healthcare and life science? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I love difficult questions. Ladies are always first. <laughs> yes. yeah. a, well, I think one of the main things, or there are two main things that I'm the most excited about, apart from what I mentioned before uh, in women's health, is really how it has a chance to democratize the access to healthcare. Because often when we think about healthcare, we think about uh, here in Switzerland, where we already have first class healthcare, which is actually maybe not that needed. Um, but I think it one really great example of how you can create a change uh, globally is um, is this startup that, that, that we're supporting, Malaika. It's in, uh, it's in Kenya. It's uh, helping women throughout their pregnancy to try to, uh, to avoid maternal deaths by simply supporting them through their whole pregnancy journey. Now there are sitting about 30 midwives chatting with women over WhatsApp. And 30 midwives can help maybe a thousand women. But imagine if you then can add a donative AI on top, giving these women medical advice throughout their whole pregnancy journey. The alternative for them is not a luxury doctor office in Switzerland. It's asking their auntie, asking uh, a relative for advice. But thanks to this a more specialized model with, with, um, with practical medical advice, you can serve basically the whole population of women. And this, I think, is really one 
of the most of the biggest promises of AI is this access to healthcare for for everyone. And then one other aspect that I really like is how it can support you in in research in find finding more relevant information. There's so many interesting publications out, out there. I don't know exactly how big PubMed is, but it's so well hidden, a lot of those findings that are in there. Um, and thanks to models that have been particularly trained on PubMed, this, uh, this information becomes much more accessible. And then, of course, you can go to the original source and double check because, yes, there are some issues with Gen AI. But it just really can bring to the surface so much more knowledge. And that's the second example then. And actually, it makes me think of MedPalm2, which is a famous new... Uh, I'm not allowed to use that word. <laughs> large language model from Google. Uh, MedPalm2 has been specifically developed for medical applications. So maybe you can say one word or two about, about MedPalm2. Uh, yeah, just Two words. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a hell of a summary. Um, so, so look, I think, I think one of the things that's been super important for the moment is to encode up to a medical examination level, um, the terminology, the notations, the way that a doctor or a, a healthcare professional thinks. This, this is a, a major milestone. It's very, very difficult to do. It doesn't mean, of course, that it provides you the ability to do healthcare, right? But it does make sure that everything that you're talking about is grounded in medical fact. It is based upon best practices from medical practitioners. So it's not made up, it's not hallucinating. It's really telling you the things, shall we say, that is known from the body of knowledge around you know, uh, medical, the medical and the healthcare domain itself. I think in terms of transforming, I, I use transformation and revolutionize, revolutionize interchangeably. It will be a combination of the two. Um, it is clear, for example, that the majority of the world doesn't actually have access to very, very high quality healthcare. They don't have access to a specialist. Um, they'll be lucky sometimes if they can actually even find a hospital or a clinic or anything within 100 kilometers of where they are living. So I think, I think one of the, the greatest transformations that will happen is the ability to democratize um, this knowledge, this domain-specific knowledge um, to literally billions of people, right? And this is basically, you know, and if I may use the, the Google word, this is actually the, the ambition of Google to make sure that this is democratized to everybody that actually needs it. I think the second thing is then being able to actually act on that information. So, you know, you, you've got your phone, your smartphone, which is like, probably going to be the device of the future that everybody will be using. It'll get bigger and better and whatever else. But I think it will start to have embedded um, <clears throat> uh, generative AI capabilities in there beyond what's actually there today. And I believe also that, you know, at the moment it's a physical device, but it may well be a virtual device, a holographic device, whatever is coming in the future. But I think what is clear is that medical practitioners are finding extreme value in what is coming out of these medically grounded um, uh, generative AI large language models. I think they are finding it as an assistive technology and it's really very helpful. I mean we are human <coughs> finally and we don't have any chips implanted into our brains yet. Um, so we have limited memory, we have limited capacity to make always the right call, the right judgment call. So I think a lot of the, the erasure, if you wish, of misdiagnosis, simply not knowing facts, staying up to date. I mean these are all human problems, we all have them. Right. I'm staying up to date with the latest therapy in, say, oncology, for example, is a, is a challenge by itself. And then you're also a practitioner. So I think that this will actually be made available, if you wish, to the practitioner, but also to the patient. And in a form that the patient can understand. I mean, I think the greatest gift of large language models is actually not the chatting function. I think actually the, the greatest gift of LLMs is to be able to understand this crazy thing that we call human language. And it's so difficult. Um, and, and that means even if I speak as one medical professional to another medical profession, using this kind of crazy thing called language, it doesn't mean that what I said is what they understood, right? So there is still this discrepancy and hence the need for formal ways of codifying this knowledge as well and being able to interchange it. And maybe we would need LLMs to actually help us uh, to do that. So yes, I think transformation, I think revolutionize, I think to reimagine literally, excuse me, a Novartis phrase here, but literally to reimagine um, the way that healthcare is delivered, where it's delivered, how it's delivered, and I would say even the nature of a healthcare professional. There is so much codified knowledge in there that perhaps, perhaps a normal person, a lay person, can already get up to certain levels of healthcare professionalism, if I can call it that, but more as a hobby, right, not as a professional certified or whatever. Um, and I think that just helps us to be able to help other people. I mean, that's basically what we do this thing for. Mm. 
Well, just maybe another aspect of that. I mean, this is what they can do on a very um, specialized level. But one other promise uh, of generative AIs in healthcare is taking care of all the boring administrative things so that doctors actually have time to, to spend time with their patients and bring, actually allow us to be more human in our interactions with each other. And that's another exciting... Um, so that's a perfect segue to my next question, because let's try to be concrete also here in the use cases, for example, about uh, Gen AI in healthcare. So doctors, for example, as you mentioned, they are uh, quite tired, actually, of all the administrative burden. So they're tired of uh, electronic health records, as they are today, because uh, there's a lot of typing to do, clicking, uh, scrolling, etc., etc. So they spend uh, almost half of their time sometimes on admin tasks. So if Gen AI now enables doctors to talk to, a, to uh, the EHR, so the clinical information system, this could be the biggest game changer uh, in the history of healthcare, potentially, um, in the history of the digitalization of healthcare. So what do you think? Is it possible to integrate seamlessly uh, such feature in clinical information systems so as doctors can just talk to the sure. computer and to the EHR? Sure, I think so. I mean, as I said, you know, the, the industry itself is relatively mature at the moment. I mean, these use cases at least they've been validated, if you wish. If they go, actually go into mainstream, that's another thing. But remember, the, the greatest gift, right, is to understand language. So, I mean, most people here have been to a doctor at one time or another. They're sitting there, sometimes typing away. Sometimes they're writing this crazy writing that even they can't understand or read afterwards. Um, sometimes they're actually speaking into a microphone and then somebody goes off and tries to type this. Imagine this disappears. So, you know, literally as I'm speaking, as a healthcare professional, as a doctor, speaking to the <coughs> patient, or well, the patient is speaking uh, to, the, to the doctor. And basically everything that's being said is being understood, translated. Uh, it is being um, entered into systems in a format that is understandable by a system. So remember, it's not just natural language you and I speak. It is also the language of these crazy things that we call computers, right? I mean, I don't know, most people perhaps in this room have spent 20 years learning these stupid languages that are now all obsolete, right? And why do we do it? So that we can speak to silicon. So what happens if I can speak to silicon just like normal English? And there are some rules that actually allow it to enter that data in. That would apply also to EHR systems. Um, that would apply to any, actually any system. Uh, and I think that that is probably the thing that will massively transform healthcare. Why? Because it removes the tedium, if you wish. It removes um, the, the, the need to do these manual things. And it literally is in the flow of speaking and everything just flows. The problem at the moment with most healthcare systems is that it doesn't flow at all. Or if it does flow, it flows in a direction we don't want it to flow. Um, it should be very, very smooth. It's conveyed from, you know, from, a, from a potential patient to the doctor. The doctor automatically in that continuum takes, if you wish, the, the information. The key elements are already extracted. They're understood from a natural language perspective. They're entered into those systems. And if they're integrated with the wider healthcare, you could just turn up to the, to the pharmacy and boom, you pick up whatever you want or you turn up to a hospital and your treatment, your procedure is already set and scheduled for you. There are maybe courtesy services, depending on how ill you really are, that can take you from point A to point B. Um, I mean, all of this should be part of the same smooth continuum. I mean, pe people don't think of healthcare as these, these disjointed experiences. So think of it more as a, as a unified experience. And, and it is an experience and unfortunately, usually a bad one for most people. Today is still quite fragmented, right? Uh, definitely, absolutely. But in your opinion, do you think this integration into the existing IT systems will happen anytime soon? It's happening now, it's happening now. So, I mean, we see already, for example, uh, in the radiology world, Jan would, is the expert on that, he probably would be able to say more, but we see, for example, that radiologists are just overworked. They are looking at this, this crazy 8K picture on the screen and they're trying to identify something that could, that could kill you or save you, right? I mean, it's very, very difficult. And it's not just one image, it's thousands of images per day. And they're working crazy hours. Of course, human error will creep in. So you need, if you wish, the power of <clears throat> other AI as well, if you wish, you know, visual AI to actually be able to inspect, but also the idea of providing additional information, assistive information, if you wish, that is coming from LLM. We are seeing this, for example, with Bayer in some of their products and technologies that they're releasing. Um, I think Siemens also is doing that. GE is also doing that. There are many, many firms that are actually doing this. And it is in that, in that end point. So, you know, the, the end point of healthcare, if you, if you wish to think about it, where we start to see actually the most interesting cases. So, you know, it's not that the, the assistive AI or the generative AI technology here is telling the radiologist a love poem, right? 
or you know, can you go write me a letter for uh, you know the tax man or something like that? No, it is actually saying to them, I think that what I'm seeing in that image is the following. What do you think? And simply from that process of questioning, you'll take a double look. And then I think also the idea of uh, being able to smoothen the way for treatment as well. Uh, so depending on you know, what the procedure is that's needed or treatment that is needed or medication that is needed, uh, including cutting edge stuff that maybe the radiologist or the doctor eventually didn't even know about. So I think surfacing, this is what I think of as Gen AI, the surfacing of information, a better search than the traditional search, but one that is also able to generate, if you wish, answers in a contextual form that are relevant. That's just a radiologist, mm -hmm. but it could equally apply to a dentist, right? A dentist takes an X-ray and uh, says, what, what the hell am I looking at? That looks bad. And then you start to see all this information is coming up. We're already seeing that today. We're seeing 3D topologies of, of, of teeth, for example. They're actually able to explain what they're doing to patients. This is very, very good from a patient experience. I mean, I don't know anybody that likes going to a dentist, apart from the dentist, right? Um, but I think that, you know, this idea of being able to ease and take away the nervousness um, and be able to provide information to you and I in an, in an easy form, this is, I think, the, the, the power of generative AI there. And it is being integrated today everywhere, literally everywhere, from genomics to precision medicine to the language of life, trying to understand drugs, all the way to healthcare itself directly, whether it's remote or in presence or ambulant, everywhere, literally everywhere. So like in six months, when I go to my general practitioner or to a specialist, uh, they will have Gen AI at the office? Yeah, probably they're writing the, the, the love letters, right? But no, the, uh, I, I think, I mean, there are, there are some barriers to adoption, right? And I, it's important to talk about them. So yeah. I think some of them are about the, you know, the, the ethics of some of these models, right? So you, know, it, you need to really validate if it's giving you an ethical, moral response, and also if it's grounded as well. So remember, a, a, a doctor intrinsically, I mean, they've been trained their entire lives uh, to look at precise facts, information, and work on that. They have a, a form of logic. Mm -hmm. That logic needs to be mimicked, if you wish, within the generative AI uh, ecosystem, and it needs to be surfaced in a way that they trust. It only takes one time to give a false answer or a hallucination, and the doctor identifies it and says, oh my God, I can't trust this thing ever again. So you know, it has also to do with not just being rolled out there, not just being used, but also being adopted as well. And the adoption requires incredible trust and that trust is based upon the grounding. And that's why I say these task-specific um, large language models. And there will be many of them. It is a, I think it is a nonsense today to talk about, you know, maybe the two prevalent ones at the moment. I'm pretty sure that within six months' time, I mean, literally a new large language model, new generative AI is being released literally every day from thousands of startups, big, small, in between, you name it. So at the end, the only thing as an architect that I would say is, it is clear that I'm going to use more than one of these things. So the skill is not necessarily choosing the, the best one. The best thing would be that I can actually interlink them together and give me an answer the way that the human brain works. The human brain doesn't just have one tiny drawer in there and I open it and I get a diagnosis, right? There's lots of drawers I need to look into. So I think, I think that would be the way that it goes. Will it be in six months time? I think that you'll start to see it creeping in. It may just be behind the reception, for example, when you, when you book an appointment. That might be a generative AI. You may be using a bot that is gen generative AI infused, for example. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be many smaller things I think that you'll start to see make the experience better and better. I think doctors, they're, they're quite conservative. There are some that are you know, really super on the, uh, on, the, on the cutting edge, but they tend to be quite a conservative, um, I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, so I think that you will see, start to see the adoption and it will spread by word of mouth, right? I mean, as people start to trust it, they'll tell their buddies, their buddies will tell their other buddies, and the next thing you know, you'll be gen AI'd, or whatever that means these days. So there's a lot of things to unpack in what you said. I think a lot of interesting things we're gonna continue talking about now. Sure. Maybe Lisa first, uh, do you have a, also an opinion about, about it? I think the tricky thing about the EHR is that it's, it's a quite messy database to begin with as well. But I think that's also one of the big promises uh, of, of gen AI. It could potentially help us to sort it out because there's so much knowledge in there that you could extract also to the benefits of patient and make prediction about their health long term. That's what you hope with general with AI in general. Um, but the main blocker there is really the format it's in and there's no consistency of how things are being recorded. Mm -hmm. And since uh, then I can really work with this unstructured data as well. I think um, it has a lot of possibilities of assisting us in generating even more interesting 
health insights. So we couldn't access this in structured data before, is what you're saying? Well, we can access it, but it's very hard <coughs> to, to extract much knowledge from it because it's, it's been so chaotic. But uh, in my experience, everything that's linked to EHR in uh, in Switzerland specifically is very <laughs> tricky to, to sort out. I think all of, our, all of you that have, have experienced that every hospital has another system that's developed by the uncle of the cousin of a, I don't know what. Uh, so, <laughs> so before you actually get into the doctor's practitioner's office, I'm afraid I think it's going to be more than six months, but I think when it does, it will be amazing. I'm beginning to get very worried about the doctors in Switzerland. I haven't visited them yet, but <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, just one, one point ahead. to add to that. So there is a use case around generative <laughs> AI. It's not necessarily healthcare per se, which is that the mess in some of these systems also comes from natural language. It comes from the way that people express themselves. Um, it comes from typos, you know, uh, misspellings, you name it. Generative AI also has the ability to kind of understand that as well. Beyond optical character recognition or understanding, uh, you know, what the letters were, it is actually uh, as a means of being able to help clean that data. And this is quite important because you can spend the next 10 years cleaning your EHR system, or you can spend the next 10 years actually advancing healthcare, if you wish. And using, I think, generative AI also in this capability, and AI as well in general, um, I think allows you to kind of clean up, if you wish, your data sources without actually cleaning them up. <coughs> so, I mean, not gonna waste time on that. Um, and allows you to kind of also eventually put them and pass them, if you wish, into formats that are well known. So, you know, whether it's a fire standard, for example, or whatever it might be. Um, remember, the, the gift of language, right? So I can also translate, including bad languages into good languages, right? Or bad formats into good formats. So I think that, you know, the, the, the ability of the, the LLM in particular in this case, right? And, and this, this element of generative AI is also the, the, this notion of getting proper data from a patient perspective, but also from a healthcare professional perspective. So the entire record, if you wish, of an individual uh, or a particular treatment therapy is kind of cleaned up and presented. This is incredibly important because as a doctor, what the first thing that I might want to do is just show me what's wrong with this person. They've, have they been here in the last six months? Where else did they go? What have they had, you know, as complications, for example? This is the way the human brain thinks. And that's the way I want to ask the question. I don't want to type an EHR super duper string in SQL and whatever else. I don't want to do that. So I think that the, the LLM here can really help because it provides, if you wish, the search that everybody always wanted. And in particular for a medical practitioner, the search that they always wanted just to bring me up the information. We're seeing this, for example, you know, you asked about six months. Well, we're seeing this right now uh, in products like Dr. Lib, for example, mm -hmm. um, where they are working this way. They are working within this ecosystem, if you wish, in France and Germany and some other countries as well. And um, they are gradually infusing more and more Gen AI into that. They started off with NLP, so natural language processing, but this is really hard work, and to be honest, it's not always fantastic. Um, but the generative AI has provided them incredible ability without any coding. I mean, that, that, is the, that is amazing, without any coding. So I think there's a lot of uh, potential there. I think it will definitely, I think revolutionize is the right word in this case. Okay, very promising. You touched upon uh, the ethical topic uh, very briefly, and I think we should uh, maybe explore that a little bit further. <coughs> so are you concerned about ethical missteps, actually, which could happen if Gen AI becomes uh, generalized in healthcare? And do you think that the benefits are outweighing the risks? It's a tricky question because, <coughs> of course, it is known to hallucinate. It is known to actually sometimes give you the wrong answers, even though it's been trained. Uh, on the right data. And of course, we have the issue again with the data gap, for instance, where, where most clinical studies have really been conducted on men and women were considered being small men with pesky hormones, uh, which uh, is not really the case. So there is like an inherent bias in, I wouldn't say, I mean, the models are representing the society as it is. and and it, Everything that goes in here is like everything that has been been published in written form since whenever we started digitalizing things in the 50s. And the changes and the revolution or this awakening for the importance of including women in your clinical studies for new drugs, this is, uh, this is only a decade old. So of course, you have a big issue with these models that you bring this to the surface, it's not going away. You can try to fine tune it 
uh, of course, to, to moderate it, but it is, it is problematic. And it's, remember, it's important to remember that all the data that is there is biased because our society is biased. But the difference between interacting with an AI and interacting with a human being is that the AI should ideally come with a warning text saying this information might be biased and it could be worth double checking and that you could actually train people in interacting with an AI, learning to know that this can be flawed and therefore you should pay attention. Normally doctors do not come with the same, uh, with the same subtitles, right? So we, are, we somehow trust doctors more because they are human beings. Um, but they should be treated with the same skepticism in many cases, especially if you're a woman, um, that, than an AI. So I think we have a better chance to, uh, to mitigate uh, the risk of a biased system than you have uh, in reality. And I do think that the benefits will, will outweigh and, and uh, really what, what we will see long term is something more positive. So these so-called hallucinations, you think, uh, might be uh, today still a main barrier to adoption or not? Yes. Um, yes, somewhere along the line, yes. But let me quickly go back to, to ethical, first of all. We, yeah. we, we jumped over ethical a little bit too quickly. So, yeah. so look, I mean, <clears throat> the whole of the AI world is made by humans today. It might change in the future, so you may have AIs writing AI, if you wish, but it is based on the way that humans think. And humans... There are facts and there are also topical items as well. So what was a fact may have changed during the course of history. Now, medical information itself tends to be pretty precise. It's, it tends to be pretty well based in the chemistry and the biology, if you wish, right? In the science and the hard sciences. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I think that that's where generative AI, at least from an ethical perspective, that's what it should be giving you, grounded information, real facts. <coughs> There is always still, and, and that's why I said I'm not a big fan of the word co-pilot, there is this idea still that is an assistive technology. And I think also the idea that a, a medical practitioner needs to make the call there and then in front of their patient or a nurse who is who's actually dealing with their patient. It is, it is, a, it is a thing that is uniquely human. And sometimes we, we screw it up, right? Sometimes we say the wrong thing to the, wrong, to the, to the patient. But I think it is uniquely human. We haven't yet been able to codify this. This is a very difficult thing to, to learn unless you, you, you watch every single doctor in every single conversation in, 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 all the time, 24 by 7, and then you still have this, this horrible choice to say, is that the right thing to say, aside from the medical facts? So I think, I think on the ethics side, it, it needs to be very heavy. I mean, this is, this is not one of those areas where it's kind of like fanciful or funny. This is, this is serious business. And um, most people take their health seriously. So it has to be grounded. I think that's, that's the key thing. The idea, the notion of hallucinations here is, um, you know, the, the fact that perhaps a model has not been trained well enough or it's been allowed a little bit too much freedom. So the notion of, of guardrails on this technology is very, very important. The idea of grounding is very, very important. And I think perhaps even more, more than that is, it is one set of technologies, not all the technologies that may make up um, if you wish, an AI ecosystem in healthcare. It is one of many. And if you wish, each of those should be kind of checking and balancing itself. I think that notion perhaps is not there yet in the industry, but it, mu it must happen. In the same way that I would ask a second doctor for a second opinion. I don't believe the first one, um, but why did I as a human go to the second one then? So there will be AI checking on AIs if the first AI is right or wrong? It has to happen because if you think of the body of information, no individual human, no body, no audience could go through that material and the number of permutations of everything. To, it's simply impossible. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to not just use machines, but we have to use these advanced machines, AI in this case, um, to actually check and constrain and control the AI. It needs to understand what is a hallucination. Mm -hmm. We use the term everywhere, like a hallucination mm -hmm. itself. And very few people understand what exactly what it is and why it's happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of reasons. So the I think the strength of the model, not how quickly you can get it to the market or you know, how much noise you make in, the, in, in LinkedIn or in the press or whatever, it is uh, how quickly you can make it applicable to the task that it was focused at. And that's why I talk about task-focused, domain-specific, knowledge-focused, generative AI. Um, very, very important. Yeah. And I would actually like to challenge the fact that you say there's always 
grounded in, in, in like science and fundamental truths. But because actually when we conduct science, that is very biased on our view on society. For example, uh, menstrual pain was considered being something completely normal and something that women had to endure. And this pain was continuously ignored throughout I mean, throughout centuries, it was not documented in centuries, maybe, but uh, or, or not in a digital form. But it's only recently that actually they have realized that this is a medical condition that requires treatments. And this this bias on how you see certain, well, I will not call women a minority because we're fifty percent of the population, but also ethnical minorities that their perception of things in medical literature has been ignored. So I would actually, I have a question for you, which would be interesting. <laughs> like when you're training these uh, models that we're not allowed to name, uh, uh, you, based you on medical... Med I, I <laughs> med he named Medipalm. Okay. Well, Medipalm, for instance, it would be very interesting if you would put more, more weight on more recent uh, research that is more um, less biased um, that, that, than old ones. So I don't know if you, because if you put the same weight on something that was conducted in the 50s and 60s to, to the more recent, there's been a huge development and it would be very important to, to have a different weight on that. So is that something that's being done or you just put it all in for the same? Yeah, I think, um, I'll try to answer it. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. So if you're talking about 50s and 60s, you must be talking about GPT because that's never up to date, right? So I think the MedPalm is up to date with the latest medical information. Yeah. And what you've talked about are areas around perception, the human understanding and the human bias of facts, if you wish, right? So, you know, for me, for me also as a scientist, it has a, a clear, measurable thing behind it, right? Um, I, I agree. Well, it's only, often it's a, it's a di like perceptions of pain and suffering from oh. patient is a very subjective measure of. Well, yes, yes, I mean how one person feels pain and another feels pain are two different things from a perception perspective. Yeah. Maybe from an electrical impulse, if you're measuring what's going across, you know, the nervous system, perhaps there is a more uh, measured means of doing that. So I'm talking about hard science as opposed to perception. It's a little bit of a minefield of that particular question, but. Um, even simply using the word, you know, bias indicates a bias, right? If you use the word bias, and that's why I said the funny thing with natural language, if you use the word bias, it means you already have in mind that something is biased, right? And, and it needs to have then facts. Yeah. And, and, and it's no problem, by the way, to, to, to do that. I think that's good. But then how do these two biases actually work against each other? And that's why I say there is something fundamentally important to understand about AI, at least as it is today, which is it is essentially human. Right? And all the, the good and the bad and the ugly and everything with humans is all in there, in one shape or another. And usually when someone says, I'm going to take out all the bias, then probably they're going to introduce a different form of bias, right? Because, I mean, you simply cannot avoid it. So I, th I, think, I think it will evolve the way humans evolve, right? So you know, if our perception of a medical fact changes over time, then perhaps that will be represented. I can't tell you whether it's correct or not. I'll simply tell you what it will report. Um, these are actually in there. So, you know, as I said, the, the difference between a a perception-based, you know, uh, model that is trained on literally everything that's out there, you know, maybe on Twitter, X, whatever it may be, uh, people have certain views, they may clash with each other, that's fine. But a, a fine-tuned medical-based, anchored in medical facts, has a, has a different fundament. It, it's, its basis is different. It's not about your opinion in this case. However, medical opinion about facts and how you interpret those, this is why we still need the human in the loop. I may see a blood pressure reading, for example, and I may interpret it one way, and someone else may interpret it another way. Um, and finally, you'd need to dig a little bit deeper to try to understand why is that, that blood pressure rising, for example, or sinking, as the case may be. And there may, there may be that the answer is not a single answer. It may actually be cause and effect, if you wish, right? So a sequence of things happening. I think these are the next sets of models that are coming out there. The ones that we have at the moment are pretty rudimentary, if you wish. Um, but this idea of, of human reasoning, if I can call it that, and we're very good at doing that, but human reasoning, the Sherlock Holmes, if you wish, of, of the medical world is, is basically the next sets of models, particularly in this space, that are coming out there. So I, th I think you cannot avoid bias. To answer your question, you cannot avoid it. By simply using the word, there is already an, uh, an implied bias. But from what I understand, from what you, from what you said, uh, you can mitigate these biases by creating these AI ecosystems, by creating very specialized, fine-tuned AI, gen AI models and by keeping the human in the loop. So 
the Gen AI will not replace any medical doctor no. in the foreseeing future. No, it, it is assistive. It doesn't have any hands and feet for the moment, right? So un until that changes, so the robotic form of this, the mobile form of this, that won't necessarily change unless you plug it into a system. You trust it enough that it actually goes beyond a generative AI into a decision support system. It's making a decision and you say, yeah, I like that, go do it. And if you, you, know, you need to trust something pretty much, right? I mean, even things like autopilot on an aeroplane, I mean, the pilots still panic when they use this thing, right? But okay, you know, they've, they've kind of learned to live with that. So I think the, the checks and balances from various AI ecosystems is important, but it cannot remove something that is actually not silicon generated. Bias is not silicon generated, it is human generated, right? And, and depending on what's popular and what the hype is at the moment, then I think that, you know, the, the systems will have a bit like a voting system, right? You know, half believe in this and half believe in that. So you will have to have, what, a consensus model, finally. Yeah. And I think also the, the important thing is that we need to learn how to interpret what comes out of the AI. It needs to come with the proper warning text. And that's also something that uh, the EU AI Act will, will take into account. And that is that you have to actually be transparent with the fact that you're communicating with an AI. So you're not thinking that this is some universal truth and you have to also be transparent with the limitations uh, that the model is having. And I think we'll need, we need to put a lot of effort in educating people on how to really use this tool properly. That's, that's a super point there, right? So the question, what the hell are we talking to? Right, so mm -hmm. is it a human? Is it a human plus AI? So I think that this idea of, um, yeah, labeling it, I think helps, but that's, that's <coughs> as helpful as standing on a landmine and, and then a label on the, on the landmine telling you that it might explode if you step off it. It might be too late. So I, I think the, the idea of um, not just labeling, but if you wish, clearly identifying and allowing people themselves to be able to understand what they are speaking with, that they can detect it themselves. I think Google made a start with this, with digital watermarking, particularly for, for generated images, for example. There'll be other initiatives. I think Microsoft also has something, and there'll be lots more around this. And I really wanna see that happening, particularly where we are synthesizing voice. What am I, what am I talking to, mm -hmm. right? What am I listening to? Where are these responses coming from? So yeah, is it a disclaimer? I think that there, there needs to be some level of regulatory oversight that people are building these things in these safer ways, I would say, in order to make sure that you're getting advice from a a medical practitioner and not necessarily a voodoo doctor who's telling you to dig out your pins and your, your little puppet, right? So you've got to be careful with these things. That leads me to, to my next topic is safety. I think you, what you're saying actually is that you, more, you have to make sure that the systems are safe to be used and to be safely used, you have to have a disclaimer and so on. So today the FDA um, uh, is clearing only AI algorithms if there's a human in the loop. Yes. So for, for now there's no Gen AI actually tool which was FDA cleared so far. Uh, wish I could have Jan to be here to answer to this question if there will be a, a Gen AI cleared soon from GE Healthcare, which is the biggest uh, company in terms of AI uh, algorithms uh, for, um, which are regulated uh, by the FDA. Um, but my question is rather, um, do you think that it's important that we build now medical grade Gen AI, AI systems, so systems which are properly validated with all the um, criteria which are required for a medical device, uh, or do you think that we should probably, we could probably rather stay in the non-medical field because there uh, you obviously have s potential safety issues as it's not uh, validated in the right appropriate way. So shall we go medical devices or not? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a view on that. So <clears throat> th there are two approaches to this. I sit on the side and wait until everything is okay and ready to use or I get started. Right now, there is um, a gray area in the middle, which is you know you're actually going to use these on people. That's a different thing altogether. I, th I think that at the moment the it's not the tooling itself, but if you wish the guardrails and the if you wish the the anchor points that make these safe technologies to use that are still maturing. They're still maturing across the industry. It was one of the reasons, by the way, that Google didn't release this monster out of the bottle, but someone beat us to it. That's that, that's fine. But there was a reason behind this because there's a lot of things to ask about the ethics, about the safety. Uh, how do you regulate something? I mean, you know, everyone says we ask the regulator, but the regulator doesn't even know how to spell generative AI. So how, what are you gonna ask them, right? So I, I think that you know, the industry itself will, through its best practices, and this is basically how regulations come anyway, 
uh, through its own best practices and its own usage of these technologies in you know, smaller forms, safer forms, like a clinical trial for generative AI in the medical and the healthcare space. And I think that these best practices will probably be the next GXP practices, right? They'll be the next regulator practices, if you wish. Um, the algorithms themselves, specifically about the algorithms that are being used, um, I think that there is a level of transparency uh, that has yet to be reached across, across the board. And this is difficult because you have open source models, you have commercial models, you have very tightly closed uh, AI models, you know, like from OpenAI, which is a bit of a misnomer, a misnomer for the name, right? But um, they need to make money, they need to make revenue, they have an existence. I have no problem with that. But when we're using it for medical technology, because it's for the good of all humankind, if you wish, there needs to be a level of transparency that at least a regulator uh, can actually apply good rules to. I don't believe that it's quite there yet. Um, it's also difficult to show, if you wish, the transparency in a unified manner across AI, right? So, you know, I may show something, Google may show something, Microsoft may show something, uh, Meta may show something, and someone else may show something else. And they may have five different standards for measuring. How, how can you apply a rule on that? So I think that there is a level of maturity from the AI industry itself, and particularly in, in healthcare and, and med tech and med devices as well. Um, that maturity is, is yet to be reached. Do I think it will get there? Well, yes, because they are already embedding AI in tools. We have robots that are actually doing surgery, for God's sakes. I mean, if we're doing surgery, it's, that's pretty serious stuff. Would we add Gen AI because we want to talk to the robot while we're doing a surgery? Maybe not. But if we ask the Gen AI maybe to play us some music while we're doing the surgery, that might be a harmless use of generative AI. Lisa, do you have an opinion about uh, should we go medical devices uh, great for Gen AI new systems? <laughs> it's a very complicated question, of course. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do it for some limited use, but everything that is, if you want to use it for a real medical application, you have to have an intended you, you, ha you have to limit the scope of it. The problem with those, uh, those big models is that they're very uh, general, that's, they refer to it like foundation models, which can be used for many different purposes. And that will be very tricky to make sure that it's really covering and performing great on all these different things. So you would probably anyway only be able to to have it medically grade for a specific purpose, answer a few specific questions, and then come out <coughs> with the right answer. And yeah, should we go medical grade? I think it would be probably easier to to design around it <laughs> and keep a human in a loop to somehow uh, uh, go, go move away from that. Yeah. Let me quickly add something to that. So, in the heart of a medical device itself, I mean, it has a it has a very hard, cold logic. It needs to do something, mm -hmm. right? Um, something very specific, and that's all it needs to do for its entire it's life. It's intended use. Right? Correct, yeah. correct. So the, the way that I see generative AI, this particular form of AI here, is not necessarily in the device itself, but rather from the outputs of the device. So if it's, if it's providing data, streaming data out, for example, then I can apply this type of technology on that data. Remember, no data, no AI, right? So if I'm getting a data stream from a medical device that is strictly regulated, it's doing its job and no other job and must not ever do any other job. But from the data itself, I can get insights, I can drive analytics, I can drive um, perhaps, you know, next best actions, for example, or perhaps even a, a course of treatment or perhaps even a medication from the telemetry that I'm seeing from the device. So, and I think, I think that is an area uh, that would be, it will also be regulated as well, because you know, you're going to make decisions on these medical grade decisions on this. But I think that would probably be the, the, one of the first areas where we start to see regulators and the industry getting together around that telemetry and actually giving insights from what is basically, I don't know, as a very simple example, it might just be a thermo thermometer. The thermometer goes up and down and it measures something, right? That's it. That's all it does. But it is only with human inferencing and the con context that I'm measuring that temperature in that I realize, oh, it's too cold for today or it's too warm for today or you know, perhaps that, that looks a bit odd, something is going on here, I'm not quite sure. The medical device might not do anything more than beep, or it might just, I don't know, flag somebody on a, on a page if these things still exist these days, right? And say, you know what, I think uh, something's not going on correctly here. That's, I think, where AI and Gen AI steps in. So I think it's a question of where you place it. It's not necessary in a medical device. It's the same with um, you know, cars. If you take a Tesla, it's not necessarily that the AI is, 
is driving the wheel, for example. But the information that's coming out from all the sensors, it may take action on that. And it's a, it's a, very, it's a very strict form of action, right? It's not going to try to fly or jump off a bridge. You know, it knows turn left, turn right, put the brakes on. It's, it's rather, rather atomic, I think. Yeah. That's maybe where we use, I think. Yeah, and maybe, but that also comes in more to the classical AI that we have been around for, uh, for a long time where you really develop AI to solve one particular purpose and not trying to be something that works for everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that is like the big step that we've done here with the latest development, going from this very one use case specific AI, analyzing temperature, for instance, uh, what, um, yeah, um, something I spend a lot of time doing in terms of fertility. It's, uh, we, had an, uh, we developed an AI to analyze uh, temperature and heart rate. Uh, that was more simple versions of it and really for one purpose only, which is quite different from, from having something that answers all the questions you might have, whether it's about planet orbits to knee pain. So probably we won't see in the very short term some medical grade gen AI tools. Yeah, it is, it is a, an odd question to answer. I mean, I'll give you an example, and then you tell me if it's a medical device, right? So, um, but very brief, because we have to have a oh, question to, to yes. the audience. Uh, very, very quickly. So um, Google released something actually for uh, diagnosing diabetic retinopathy using your smartphone, okay? Um, the smartphone is not a medical-grade device, not, not by any means, and yet it's being used as one to make a, a first-pass diagnosis, for good or for bad. I'm not going to argue about the accuracy, but just say for good or for bad, it's being, it's being used that way. And I suspect that more and more of this will happen. What we think of these medical devices will really be for very, very specific, um, you know, close to the body or in the body uh, type use case, if you wish. But I think that the, I think it will start to creep in there as we start to actually talk to these devices. Remember, the gift of language. Can I then speak to that device? Because at the moment, it's, it's a very ugly form of programming to actually program one of those sensors or one of those devices. So I think, I think that's maybe where we start to see this, this gray zone uh, where things start to occur. Thank you very much. So now I would like to open the questions for the audience. So if there's any question, please ask it now. That's the right moment. Easy questions to me, difficult questions to leave. <laughs> yeah. oh, there's a question over there. Thank you. So we, we keep mentioning AI, and you've also mentioned that it's a misnomer. How far away are we from actual intelligence? Because right now they're just predictive models based on statistics, as far as we understand. Is that an easy one or a difficult one? Would you like to answer that? <laughs> I would say that's a typical Google question, because <laughs> I'm, st <laughs> I'm still stuck in the more uh, prediction model uh, era, or we leverage things that are, have been developed by, by other companies like uh, Meta's models or so. I think, Google, you're closer to actually developing. I'll give you a view. I'll give you a view. <laughs> so artificial, artificial intelligence itself, I mean, as you've said, it, it's kind of based on predictions, right, eventually. And, and some of the algorithms are like, they really do go back to the 50s and the 60s, right? Some of them are very, very old. Um, but remember what AI actually stands for, right? Artificial intelligence. A human or a group of humans try to encode their knowledge, their experience, into a, uh, an algorithm, and they try to scale the algorithm so it could be used at much greater scale. So did AI fail? Did we reach that point? I don't think so. We definitely got there, without question. Many of the things that we do today on the amounts of data that we're working with today would simply be impossible, right? So I think the, the question and the answer you just provided for yourself, so thank you very much for answering that. I think going beyond that, though, I think going beyond that um, is the idea of will AI write its own AI going forward? Will it write the next sets of algorithms? Will it really generate and create something? So not just generate, but create, if you wish. I think, I think that's the, the slippery slope we're on, right? So that is the Pandora's box for the moment. We don't know if it's going to wipe us all out or whether it's going to be wonderful. We don't know. But I think, I think the potential, the promise is there. And the guardrails are very, very important to apply. In this, so you know, a harmless algorithm, if you wish, but how it's then applied might not be so harmless. So there's, I think there's quite a lot of um, uh, points uh, that go towards that. So um, if you asked about, you know, AGI, that would have been a different question. But luckily, you didn't ask that question. That would have been genuinely a difficult one. 
Um, but I think, I think AI, we are definitely moving forward in that. You must feel that already. You obviously come from uh, this background, from the phrasing of the question itself, somewhere along the line. So I think that, you know, the, the world of analytics, advanced analytics, data mining, AI, and then going further and further. I mean, if you wish, we're on that continuum. What will come after AI? I, I don't know. I don't know. Will it be really artificial? Will it really be augmented? I think, I think that's the next challenge for us, right? You know, not just asking something, but the, the knowledge is instantly there. And what will that be? I don't know. Will that be like a Tesla Neuralink uh, chip in our hands or brains or whatever it is? I have no idea. I have no idea. But it is clear in the way that we think and the way that we instantly come up with an answer uh, that AI is still, there's still a, a gap there, right? You, you can see that. The things that we know and remember as well, because we have a limited capacity for, for memory as well, is, is instant. It, its ability to kind of, you know, work on this massive amount of, of data is, is incredible. It shouldn't be so much of a surprise because, you know, we're talking about trillions of neural connections. The largest data centers in the world don't have trillion anything in there. Right. So, I mean, you know, we still need to come up to that that scale. But I think the I think the path and the vision <coughs> and again, the, the ability to understand something that was, has really been a problem for us to understand, which is our own damn language. We have such problems to understand this thing. And now we can do it in silicon. And I think that opens doors to us that that before were simply not there, including, you know, not working with a, an algorithm from the old AI, classical AI world, but maybe simply to ask the data a question as a human and let it generate the algorithm let it find out the insight for me. That would be AI. And I think we are there. I mean, there are many instances of that. I think we are there. Yeah. Just for the sake of time, keep your answers sh as short as possible. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> difficult for me to do, but I'll try. Uh, there's a good question actually from the online audience. I wouldn't want to ask maybe you, Lisa. Uh, can you give your perspective on how data privacy, and we haven't spoke, sp spoken so much about this, and we know there are some legal fights in the US, especially re regarding how models are, are, are trained and on which data they are trained and so on. So how data privacy is ensured when applying Gen AI in healthcare practice? There are many ways that you can actually do it in a way that you're preserving um, in the privacy. You can actually have them run locally. You don't need to connect to, to any of the cloud providers either. If you have, if you have um, <clears throat> a smaller model that is really trained for specific surfaces, you could take one of the open source models like Llama 2 and you can have it run locally, train it specifically in the domain that you really want to use it. And then you can use it on your own data and get, generate the answers linked to your data without uh, it ever leaving the premises. So that would be a good way of preserving the privacy. So there are a lot of ways uh, of doing it. I don't recommend you to, to send out uh, patient-specific data to, uh, to ChatGPT, for example, and, and ask for, for it back because there the privacy cannot be guaranteed, but you can also set up private instances uh, on the cloud uh, where it will not really yeah, be linked to any other providers. So there are definitely ways of setting up this in a way that you can ensure the privacy. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a slightly different view on that. So recently we released a, Google released a paper from DeepMind that showed how you could actually see with, with GPT in this case and other models as well, they evaluated Llama and a couple of others. They could actually reverse engineer, if you wish, the training data. Yep. Right? So if uh, you I wish, see. yeah. So there is a new, there is a new <coughs> potential cyber vector that needs to be taken into account. As I said, the technology is maturing as it's released, right? Um, I agree with Lisa that medical information, i.e. your PII data, your data, really your data, should not be used to train the model necessarily, um, not unless it's anonymized and you know, it has nothing that's related to you. And I think usually the best practice is to actually surface the data from a system of record, maybe an EHR system, um, but using generative AI, if you wish, to, to bring it up in a format through natural language. So it's not being stored in the model. Um, itself, it's, it's simply calling up. So in this case, it's an agent, an actor for you on your behalf from a system that is, you know, secured by nature, right? It's a more transactional type system. Um, and then I think also if you're using um, cloud technologies, there are differences also in terms of the ability to make sure that your data is staying within your tenant, for example. Mm -hmm. But having, <laughs> having said that, that, that DeepMind paper is, is a little bit worrying because even in your data, in your tenant, for example, there may be other people in your organization that are able to reverse engineer 
So depending on what you trained it on, you, you do need to take a little bit of care. So that's why I said, you know, it's, it's, it is good to try, to innovate, to invent. I think it's fantastic. But be, be mindful that we are learning new things like literally every day. And that's one of the new things, a, a bit shocking for us as well. Yeah, we came out pretty good, by the way. Well done. So any other questions from the audience so over there? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you for the nice presentation. I missed a little bit in the discussion of the ethical aspects the questions of a potential shift of powers with the application of, of AI. So I, I would not refer to whatever Terminator or robots or things like this for power, but more uh, kind of getting used to use AI for anything. I mean, I already see in, in my environment that's happening right now. So people are, oh, I have a question. I ask ChatGPT for the answer. And so what would you see as sort of a rail guard you mentioned yeah. to avoid uh, going in, in, uh, this, in a direction that maybe we don't want? You want to answer that or shall I? <laughs> I wish I talk too much apparently, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very hard to guardrail that. If you imagine there, you have this um, <clears throat> dict authoritarian regimes, they will put whatever they want there and they will control. There's no way you can actually um, put those guardrail <laughs> in place to prevent this happening. At the moment, I think we are delivered to the trust of uh, of big tech they have pretty much their um, you know our destiny in <laughs> in their hands for good and worse and and you see it quite clearly as well with chat gpt now it's it is quite liberal in its view and and the conservative right is now criticizing it for being too woke uh, so there's definitely a bias in that machine in which might be more convenient for us in Europe, whereas there are others that are very much against this. And if we choose to adapt um, to what they, if we are using what they put out, we are also victims of it. But I think it's very positive development was happening with so many new open source models coming out, which is actually counterweighing this a little bit. And we can see a much more diversity of it and and there are a lot of, of hackers that are, they, they won't be able to, to generate those huge uh, large language uh, models with 200 billion uh, parameters. But if you go down to, to smaller models, you can even train it on your own PC if it's powerful enough. And I think this is where a lot of the hope is happening <laughs> as well. So, That's so, so let, me, let me give an answer to that because none of that addresses the power shift there, right? So. Let me put politics to the side. I mentioned the word bias. I think everyone understands what that word means and I'm not gonna go further in that direction, right? But I think the, the shift of power, who does what or what does what in this particular case, I think sometimes it's important to understand when not to use generative AI or any AI. As an example, someone's having a heart attack, you're a medical practitioner, are you gonna go on your phone and try to type something chat GPT or are you just gonna do your job and actually help the individual, right? So domain specific. Right. If you're a, a layperson and have no idea what to do, you may do that. I think in terms of actuating, so really doing something with the technology, I think at the moment, most of it is really assistive in the sense that it provides you information. So I think of it as surfacing of information, knowledge that is domain specific. And I really do mean domain specific. It's not, <laughs> not this general thing that we're talking about. We're talking about something very, very specific here. And I think that you know, the, the ultimate power there lies eventually in the human, the human in the loop. There must be a human in the loop for the moment because everybody trusts humans apparently although we know that the differences between one doctor and another or one practitioner and another there can be differences in knowledge in experience in handling as well um, so you know to answer your question it's it's again the answer is uniquely human right so how do you deal with two humans and how they shift their thing you disagree with them you try to debate you have at you have basically an, either an adver adversarial type of viewpoint and there are adversarial neural networks, so you can train them that way, so they fight against each other to try to come up with a consensus. But the, you know, the question, as I said, it's in, it's in natural language, right? And as it's in natural language, it has not a precise shape or size to it. So you can bend it whichever way you want. I think that humans are creating these things. 
today. It doesn't really matter from where it comes. They are creating it. So whatever humans are thinking at that time, so whatever's trendy or whatever they have as a personal belief, will intuitively flow into the model. Now we have a lot of mechanisms from you know people checking the code, systems checking the code, so a lot of things in the ecosystem that are counterbalancing, if you wish, one way or another. And then I think in terms of ethical use, I think this is still also in the medical field. It's 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 pretty clear, right? The, you know, the, there is a I think there's a course in ethics when you do you know train to be a doctor, right? So there are some ethical guidelines, and that's why I said the fine tune models, MedPalm in particular, is trained according to those guidelines. If you don't like those guidelines, then the guidelines need to change, and so does the model. If that kind of helps a little bit to answer that. So I think we have to wrap up. Do we have time for one more question or? One more question. Okay. okay. So. The audience. Someone Any question for the audience? Last one? Okay, very last one, short one. And short answer, please. <laughs> I, th I think two questions because the gentleman's been waiting for some time as well. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. That's fine, two oh. questions. Uh, all right, very short. a very short question. Uh, you mentioned AGI a little bit earlier. Um, when do you think the human in the loop will actually be the weakest link? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> aren't they already? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, depending on which context you take. I mean, if we're looking at... If we're looking at healthcare, the, the overwhelming sentiment at the moment is that AI is not necessarily the thing to be trusted just yet. It, it is a sentiment. Is it true? It may be, it might not be. It depends on which context we're talking about. In other fields like, um, like self-driving, for I mean, something that everybody understands, right? Um, some people believe in the self-driving capability, some people don't. Some people need to keep their hands on the, the wheel. And I think that hands on the wheel is exactly the, the contextual model that we should be talking about. I mean, you need to make sure that the, the medical practitioner, um, <clears throat> who has years of experience, right, the human pieces that cannot be duplicated in, in any kind of silicon form, uh, have their hands on the wheel. And therefore, it's an assistive technology. It helps them to drive better, safer, possibly. But every now and then, you need to step in with your greater competence or sometimes incompetence, depending, right? I mean, it can also go the other way as well. Um, it's not necessarily a, a, an AGI style question specifically, but level of trust. And I think that's still something to, to build. Yeah. Very short one. Mm -hmm. A quick one from my side. Uh, you, we discussed about the regulations, regu guardrails, security, uh, and all. Uh, with regards to that, uh, there are two approaches that uh, we are taking, for example, one is coming from the US, a mm -hmm. bit more open open and a liberal approach towards this innovation. Uh, another is uh, coming from EU, a bit more slightly risk averse ab approach, a uh, bit cautious approach. Both, obviously, both has its uh, pros and cons. How do you see these two ends of uh, a spectrum to be balanced uh, for your view, especially in the medical industry? Mm. I think it's very important to have uh, guardrails and make sure it's all actually these regulations is really about ensuring uh, transparency that ensures the high quality of the products that you're building because of course th there are amazing products out there but there will si since those things are now open source anyone can train anything and if you don't have any type of regulation and enforcing transparency on what data it has been trained on, how it's been validated. I don't really see how we can ensure a safe uh, use, or sorry, a safe application of this, uh, these solutions. So I think it's really important that we have it. At the same time, it's a lot of worry in the European side that you're kind of crippling uh, the development of AI, of course. Um, but I think that for the med, so therefore, it's, it's hard to say on for any kind uh, of Gen AI how, how regulated it should be. But I think in medicine, it is really important. And can't, if you can't validate it and make sure that what comes out of there actually uh, is correct, or at least on par with the doctor, it can never be 100%, of course, and that's not the expectation, right? Uh, then it shouldn't be released and it shouldn't be used for, for medical use. So I'm, I'm more for that regulation. So, so I tend to be a bit more optimistic on that. It's a, it's a relatively simple question, but it has a very subtle, a subtle point to it. <clears throat> if you're a doctor and you're practicing in Germany, you will practice in the way that Germany tells you to practice, as an example. You'll follow the rules. It's not your foundational medical knowledge that's at question here. It's how you apply it within that market, how you're told to apply it, right? It is the same in the US as well. Liberal or not, there are rules, and sometimes they can be 
stronger or weaker. So what this kind of brings us on to point, the subtle point is, it is clear that there is a foundational knowledge. So, you know, we talk about foundational models in the general language sense. And I think that, you know, things like MedPalm are also a, a foundational medical knowledge. It's like everything you need to know about the human body, la 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 la. Okay. And then I think around that, what needs to happen is probably this idea of sovereignty, possibly, or if you wish, the consensus within a particular market. So EU, they, they don't necessarily agree, but they kind of agree, if you wish, right? I.e. the rules are there for everyone. Um, that needs to be kind of put on top of these. So these are kind of anchoring now, if you wish, the the wild nature of AI, right? So, you know, you if you trained it with all the knowledge of every medical thing that was ever out there, then don't be surprised that it answers you when you ask it a question. So I think this is this brings us on nicely to the point of what we call prompt engineering. So the, the difficulty at the moment is not getting the answer. The difficulty at the moment is actually asking the right question. I, I'm a doctor and I would, like to, I would like to know how to do the following is not specific enough. I am a doctor that is practicing in the EU, following the EU compliance regulation XXXX, and I would like to know what the procedure or the plan is for this type of uh, treatment or this type of uh, procedure. It's a very, very precise question. And if you think about it, a part of that question is implicit in the doctor that is operating within that territory, for example, so they don't ask it anymore. But, you know, again, AIs, they're a little bit stupid, right? You really do need to give them an explicit question. Okay, so unfortunately, we really have to close the session. It was Such a pity, we were I just know. getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and there, there are plenty of more questions from uh, online, the online audience we can answer, so sorry for that. But uh, one of my takeaways here, um, that is that it's just the beginning, actually, of a journey for the story of Gen AI in healthcare. Uh, and we have only scratched, as you said, the surface, I think, of it. There will be plenty of other topics. But I think you gave already a very enlightening expert perspective, at least in my opinion, uh, about uh, the different use cases, about the limits in terms of adoption and the ethical concerns and so on. Um, so I think um, let's do our best now, whatever role we have in the healthcare ecosystem, to make sure that it's applied in a meaningf meaningful way. So thank you again for uh, the speakers. And I think they really deserve a round of applause. So just one, one last thing, uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the event. Uh, we did a really fantastic job uh, in the background. Special kudos to, kudos to yourself and uh, Anka as well. And of course to all of you for coming here today, uh, despite the Siberian weather. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much and uh, have a very nice evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Just thank you to our panelists today. I've learned a lot. So thank you so much and for this enriching conversation. I think we can all, there have been a lot of questions left in the pipeline. We can keep the conversation on the apero right next to us. And as you know, this is an event series where we bring trend topics. And our next event is going to be on March 11th, 2024. So save the date in your calendars. The topic and registrations will be out very soon. But I can already promise it is going to be as exciting <laughs> as today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here. And looking forward to seeing you on March 11th.